back to the next episode of Iraqa Central. Before we get started, please remember to like and subscribe if you enjoy this channel. This is going to be my spoiler filled review of Dune Part 2. If you want to know my overall review of this film, check out my spoiler free review and where I gave it a 9 to 9.5 out of 10 due to the fact that there was a few things from the book that I wanted to see in here and they didn't have it. But overall, the movie is fantastic. Now let's jump straight into this. The first thing you see when you, the movie begins is a narration by Princess Erlon, where she basically summarizes the events of the last film very effectively, honestly. And it talks about the reaction of the Emperor. The Emperor basically, he stops talking and stops acting the same way after the Atreides was wiped out. And then the Princess Erlon basically says the same thing, that she was also not the same. This is kind of a foreshadowing, basically letting the audience know that yes, bad things are coming. This is not the end of the situation, and they could all feel it. After that little opening scene, it jumps straight into where we left off at the end of Dune Part 1, where Paul and Lady Jessica or traveling to the Siege Tabor with Stilgar and while carrying the remains of Jameis. His very first scene starts off with a, a suspenseful action scene where hunters, Harkonnen hunters, are still searching the deep desert for remaining witnesses. It, it kind of alludes to their hunting the Fremen and they weren't necessarily looking for Paul and Jessica. And this whole scene is amazing. Uh, has the, the Harkonnen hunters with anti-gravity holdsman technology, which is your basically suspensor technology, which is in the book, in the lore. Using that with their suits, hunting the Fremen. They basically, Paul and Lady Jessica hide behind some rocks in the scene. It's very effective. Then oh, they call a worm. They get scared. They go to the top of this rocky plateau. It was basically a trick, a trap to get him up there so the Fremen could basically snipe him and take him out. And this whole scene is just blows, blew me away. It's actually one of my favorite scenes of the movie. It's really great. They take out these hunters. And then after that, it jumps straight into them harvesting the water off of the dead bodies. It's, it's And surprisingly, this movie has a bit of humor in it, like a perfect little level of humor, humor from Stilgar and some of the Fremen that just... It's actually a perfect balance of this serious science fiction movie. And it adds a little bit of humor that was not really in the first one. There's slight scenes with some humor, but really they kind of just up the humor about 10, 15%. And it gets it to that perfect medium, honestly. So this movie has a perfect bit of humor in it. So when they get to the, the siege, I was expecting that there was going to be some moment where Paul would, you know, assume the caretaker or the, you know, the ownership of Jameis's widow and the sons, but they totally cut that part out of the movie from the book. So there is no situation where he essentially has Jameis's wife as a maid or housekeeper or wife or whatever, and the sons are not his. So that was cut probably for time and editing. Well, that lack of Jameis's wife and children was one of the first things I noticed that stood out to me from that was not that was in the book that wasn't in the film, which it didn't bug me because the movie needed to move forward. And then everything else throughout plays out pretty normal at this point. And then we get to the point where Jessica is going to accept the water of life, become the Reverend Mother, and this scene is condensed, changed. There is no, you know, party where she changes the poison and then gives it to Paul and every, everybody else and all those other scenes. And there's none of that. It's just she gets it. And then, of course, she's pregnant with Alia. Alia becomes aware inside the womb. That all happens, like, in the book. So there's slight changes with the way Lady Jessica becomes the Reverend Mother. There's no cave orgy or any of that. <laughs> which is in the so getting to probably the main major change from the book 
is that there's a complete time cram. So the book is like two, two and a half year period that Paul's and Lady Jessica are out there with the Fremen doing the guerrilla warfare. This takes place in the matter of about what? Eight months or so. It seems like this movie. So Aaliyah is never born. But I do find this change did not bother me at all. And I felt it clever how they had Aaliyah sentient and talking to Lady Jessica from her, the womb to her. Kind of advising her, manipulating Jessica almost in a sense. Jessica, when she takes the water life, she almost becomes kind of not evil, but sinister and maniacal as she's seen the path that we have to survive by any means necessary, essentially the way I took it. And she then begins the push for Paul to be used as the Messiah, at least in Al-Ghaib. And she says to him, we have to make this happen or else we're done for. Paul is apprehensive. He doesn't want to do all that. He doesn't like using the Fremen. He loves that. He honestly respects and loves the Fremen, the vibes he gives off in this film. And he doesn't want to abuse them and use their trust and their beliefs. And Lady Jessica, pretty much off the bat, says, and when she becomes the Reverend Mother, you're going to have to take. Actually, she when he comes out of her little, when she finally wakes up, the first thing she says, you're going to have to see. You're going to have to drink the water of life she tells him right off the bat which i found was pretty interesting so overall this first half of the film really until we get up to giddy prime it mostly follows the book the pacing's condensed i feel that the action is awesome we start seeing them doing the gorilla affair bringing spice harvesting to almost a standstill there's all that awesome scene and the only difference the main difference Really, the big change is the uh, fact that Aaliyah isn't born. So there's no, like, two-year-old walking around talking like an adult, which I think they did that because that might be a little too creepy for mass audiences. This did not affect my review at all. I thought that this was a fine change. Then we get to finally get to Giddy Prime, where we're going to start seeing Fade Ratha. And this, surprisingly... There's a part here, well, not really a part, but an omission. They left out a character who Fair Hawat is not in this movie at all. And this was personally what kept the movie from being a 10 out of 10 for me. Because I really wanted to see the Mentat being poisoned and forced to work for the, the Harkonnens unwillingly. And I thought he, we were going to see even just maybe a couple seconds. 15 second or him in the background maybe him standing behind the baron you know looking disheveled or something and maybe he says like don't you know maybe he would have gave him like hey you're working for us now and we have we're controlling you with the poison or something like that they didn't have any of that and it, it bummed me out i really wanted to see that so that's honestly that one little part being out of the movie is what kind of lowered the score for me from a 10 out of 10 that might surprise some people because they would think that the whole change of uh, Alia until we get to the end also there's a change at the end of the movie some people might think that would change my view but that really didn't bug me it was for whatever reason I really liked the Thufra Hawa from the first film and I, I really wanted to see him again so I was just kind of bummed out but that overall that was a very small issue there's so many changes from the book really between part one and part two that it, it's a lot of condensing and, and skimming down for movie sake. So, I mean, when we get to the fade, there's no... The gladiator scene is actually right out of the book. So that is awesome. They drug and poison, slow down the Atreides uh, fighters they have. They have all that scene. Awesome. I can't remember his name, but he was like a senior military uh, commander or master at arms of some sort that worked under, I think he was directly in the chain of command with Gurney. I don't remember his character's name. He was an Asian looking fellow. He shows up as a captor and they use him, which I was like in this scene, they used the last three tradies for Fade to attack and fight in the, in the arena. And I was like, wow, man, I remember that guy from the first movie. And uh, I, was, I felt kind of bad actually. So they had some kind of, you know, 
wiping out the Atreides was very a looming issue in this movie, and it, and it felt very real, very true that they were getting wiped out. So also on Gidi Prime, we see that there is a Lady Fenrir there that's there to try to seduce Fade. They have that. And the Lord Fenrir is not in there, just her. And she's basically working for the Bene Gesserit to secure the seed of Fade, which they do do all that. That's pretty cool. And then they don't have the subplot of Fade trying to assassinate the Baron. It doesn't say that didn't happen. It could have happened. At... I, I'm thinking it didn't happen. They kind of reverse it and have the Baron not drug the final Atreides. So Fade has to fight him, you know, one on one, fully, you know, him fully coherent, not drugged. And it was almost a implied that the Baron did that on purpose, but you don't really know. You think you think that possibly the Baron was just testing Fade. If he survives this, takes out this fighter, then then he is he deserves to, you know, take over Arrakis, defeat him, because at this point Raban is failing on the spice production due to the Fremen and Paul. They don't know that Paul is Paul yet. They think he's just Muad'Dib. That word's getting around. And all that's still going on. And of course, you know, Fade wins. He confronts the Baron. He's in the tub. He's pissed that he tried to get him killed. But then he was like, oh, I was just a birthday gift for you. <laughs> that's pretty funny. And then we cut to the scene where Lady Fenry's in the halls. He Prime seduces him with the voice and all that. Tests him with the box, which I thought was a fun little twist in there. She pulls the box out, and then the, it, off camera, you know, she basically seduces him and gets pregnant with his a daughter from Fade, which is interesting. Eventually, we have the scene. It cuts to where uh, Gurney Halleck has been with the smugglers. He's, smug he's trying to mine spice. There's an awesome scene where the Paul and the Fadaikin take out with these giant metal mines, these magnetic mines, to this kind of clunky spice harvester that Gurney's operating. Of course, he's about to get killed, whatever. It, it kind of alludes that Paul knew it was him from the beginning or something. It didn't really say if he just found out. He didn't kill him, of course, you see. He's reunites with Paul, so that scene's in the film. It's awesome, actually. It's a cool scene. Gurney joins up with him now, and then that's when we realize that Gurney wants him to get revenge as well. And then we realize that he has... He knows the, the location of the Atreides family atomics, which is awesome. And they have this whole scene where they go in there, they find the atomics, the missiles. It's awesome. I loved it. So this was the scene where I was talking about in my spoiler free, my red line in the sand. I had to have the atomics in this movie. But I knew there was explosions from the trailer, but I didn't know how. And the way this plays out is just was my favorite scene of the movie. And then to jump to it, Fade takes over. There's a whole scene with the Harkonnens, the command center. Now that part of the movie, there's there's scenes where you are in the Harkonnen command center on Arakeen, or the city of Arakeen. And it shows like, I don't know if they're Mentats or just kind of their controllers, because you have to bear in mind, AI is banned. So humans have to do all the work and all the analyzing and all the computing. So it shows all the Harkonnen kind of Mentat looking, you know, mission control guys. And they're talking and mumbling. And they have these cool 3D map scenes of Arrakis. Those are just beautiful, cool 3D map of Arrakis with like harvesters going down. Bloop, they turn red, units disappearing from the all the... It's just, I love that little subtlety. It's amazing. So our band basically gets punked. Fade takes over and then he starts basically taking these giant artillery warships that he brought from Gidi Prime, uh, uh, shows apparently, and he just starts pounding freaking Siege Tubber, and then um, they see it from a horizon, the, the group, Paul's group, the Chani, and then they decide to go back there, investigate, start rescuing people, then a war cancel in the south, because that's pretty much... A whole thing in this film is the northern Fremen versus the south Fremen. The northern are more kind of modern, I guess you could say, and the people in the south really believe in the coming of uh, Muad'Dib and Isa Al-Ghalib and all that. Oh, before we get into the next, kind of towards the end of the film, the love story between Chani and Paul, I felt was 
balanced pretty well. You could tell there might there might have been some scenes cut out of them bonding. It, but I think it's it's not overly like mushy mushy all that kind of crap. So it's pretty good. And they made it changed her a little bit from the book. Kind of actually, they totally flipped it around for her just kind of being there in the book to her not wanting Paul to become like a killer. <laughs> so it's kind of interesting. So we finally get to the scene where Paul does finally finally take the water of life and then he finally sees and there's this cool scene where Chani's pissed they use her there's a there's a prophecy scene in there it's awesome because Sahaya is her secret name means uh, what is it well dipper or something like that and then all this cool scene where she uses a tear and it's part of the prophecy and then that's when Paul finally sees the one path I didn't really have an issue with the changes in Chani, the streamlining of the timeline, Aaliyah not being born. None of that really bothered me. Um, I did at the final showdown, Paul, of course, that he lures the Emperor to the uh, Imperial landing site outside of Eric Keen. He comes down. Of course, I won't really. You ha the only real way to s grasp the effect. You know, scale of the final assault is you have to see it yourself. But it's just amazing. The atomics are used, the worms assault. My only gripe about that final battle is I wish it was longer, honestly. It needed to be longer. Um, there was no storming necessarily. You don't see them storming the little palace landing site. So I wish I, they do they do storm in eventually, but just kind of it's a lot of it's off camera, some of that's part. So I kind of wish we would have seen. And Paul doesn't actually really fight at all in that battle. He just kind of walks in, and the, the, the millions of fremen are doing all the work. So that is, I think that was kind of the point. But I would have liked to seen maybe a, another minute or two of the action. We do get a scene where, because Gurney's mission was to take over the city of Arakeen, which is across the, the valley. And he does have a showdown with Raban. That also was too short. That should have been at least a little 20, 30 second fight. It was like he basically dodged his whip, boom, and he stabbed him. So I was a little bit, you know, the, the fight was a little, um, was a little uh, slow, not slow, but short. But that's actually more action than in the book. The book has, very little action really so adding this much action is already a plus so it's, it's pretty awesome finally the showdown with the emperor uh they there's no leah so when paul storms in this is a big change also from the book paul is the one who kills the baron shanks him right in the throat which i thought was pretty cool throws his body in the desert but that's gonna bother people because it's supposed to be uh, Alia, and she's not born, that's also going to bother people. So I said in my other review, if you are a die hard, this had to be word for word, scene by scene, play by play from the book to the film. You're not going to like this movie. Probably not going to like it. But then again, like I said in my last video, if you were already that way, you didn't like Dune Part 1, because that one had a lot of changes too. That being said... I'm not angry about it. I guess the only thing that bugged me was no through for Hawat. Everything else, the changes, I didn't mind. Uh, the fade fight with Paul was actually really good. That part I enjoyed. I thought that was going to be like, oh, boom, bop, boom, 10 seconds, and then he wins. But they actually had attention to it, and it went on for a little bit, for a couple minutes, I'd say. So that was good. I liked how there was a little bit of tension, how he actually beat him. And then we jumped straight to where, well, right before that, he was saying he was gonna take Princess Erlon's hand in marriage. And then he was basically challenged the emperor, stand or pick your champion, because that's, that's usually the Imperium way. Fights fade, the fate goes, fade goes down. And this is the change from the book also was that 
Tawny was basically in the book. I think she was just kind of going along with it all, if I remember correctly. And in here, it's Zendaya, and she's like, oh, you betrayed me. Even though he's, like, basically already implied, like, hey, this is the plan. Uh, he didn't say, like, hey, whatever you see or whatever happens, it's not what you think it is. He never says that. He just basically says, I love you forever kind of thing. And then starts to essentially, you know, the trainer. So there's no explanation of like I'm gonna keep you as concubine and have kids with you, and she'll never touch. I'll never touch the the princess. All that doesn't really happen, though. So that's kind of left unsaid. So he basically is on the out. You know how what we see in the film, he does kind of betray Chani a little bit. But we all know his plan. This is his path. This was the only path that he could see that they could survive. And they kind of they really do show that in the earlier in the film like we're dead like our family is is, is going to be you know killed this is the only slim path that we can take that we actually make it out of this alive and that's basically you know told earlier on when he first takes the water alive so i do like that that's and that's how that's why he's doing this that's what he has to do the jihad or the holy war it was the only way that him, his mom, sister, Chani, all the people he cared about, the Fremen that he cared about, Gurney, all of them. This is the only way they were going to live, was to actually do this war. So that was pretty interesting. It's kind of kind of scary, if you think about it, in a good way. It's a cool plot point. But in closing, I'll wrap this up with the performances. All the performances were awesome. I wanted to see more Baron, more... Raban and Fade. I wish they kind of would have showed more of that. Fade gets good screen time, I think. But the Baron is really kind of... He's still recovering from the poisoning. From the... from He's kind of messed up. He has, like, these, you know, medical canisters floating with him all the time. Because he never really fully recovered from the... Huey's poison tooth. From Duke Leto. They show that pretty well. No one's talked about that, really, either. The Baron's messed up. And then he, you know... Has the scene where he's going to pass off promise fade the emperorship eventually which is pretty cool would have liked to see more of that definitely wanted to see through for hawa there's really no mention of the spacing guild at all in this one and i've seen some interviews of denny villeneuve he he didn't really that wasn't his favorite part about dune it seemed appears that he liked the bene Gesserit, so they're kind of he used them as like the main thing yeah, so they should have had at least like one little scene with the Spacing Guild guy or something at the end of the throne room or something. But they didn't do that. Uh, see the Emperor, Christopher Walken. He's in it, but he was not in it enough. But he's not really that in it in the book either, the Emperor. And then Irulan was, I think, some people were saying they wanted more of her. But I think she, she was in it the perfect amount. If Doom Messiah gets greenlit, she'll be in it a lot. And I don't know what people are going to think of Dune Messiah when it comes out. Because it's a slower type of book where there's, you know, the different factions want to assassinate and get rid of Paul. There's a whole scene where Duncan Hido gets reanimated. And he's supposed to be one of the assassins. And then Aaliyah's in there like trying to negotiate everything. She's becoming a young adult. And then all this other stuff's going on in Dune Messiah. There's not a whole lot of action in that book. So I don't know if they'll combined, make a combined effort between a few of the books or what they'll do. But I guess we'll see that in the future. But overall, Timothy Chalamet, awesome in this movie. Paul nailed it out of the park. I like Chani. Some people said they didn't like Zendaya. I had no problem with it. It was some of the omissions and some of the changes bugged me. But overall, the, as a film goes, it's an amazing film an amazing film so the only way to see this is a big screen IMAX um, I'm gonna go and try and see it on a real IMAX in, next weekend we see it again in the, the 70 millimeter recommend this film if you are a science fiction fan you'll love this this blows everything out of the water right now I've said it in my other review and please write in the comments if there's any other I mean there is a lot of changes you can go on for hours of the changes from the book but I went over the basic big ones okay if you do like this video, please like and subscribe to this channel, and I will see you next time.